Good afternoon, and welcome to our second COVID-19 Vaccine Information Forum. My name is Joanna Wolf. I'm Vice President of Advancement and University Relations at UHD, and I'm very pleased to emcee this conversation on the COVID-19 vaccine safety and efficacy. The vaccine is now available to all adults, regardless of age or pre-existing conditions. And while this is a great milestone, many people still have questions about its safety and efficacy, and even some hesitation about receiving it. This series is a vision of President Blanchard to share information with our UHD community about health and safety related to COVID-19 and the vaccine. And joining President Blanchard as our medical expert for today's panel, we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Peter Hotez. Dr. Hotez is best described as a scientist, researcher, author, and science explainer. With appointments as Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and Professor of Pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine, he is also the co-director of the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development and endowed chair of tropical pediatrics. As head of the TCH Center for Vaccine Development, he leads a team developing new vaccines as well as promoting their availability. Dr. Hotez obtained his undergraduate degree in molecular biophysics from Yale, followed by a PhD in biochemistry from Rockefeller University and an MD from Wild Cornell Medical College. Most recently, as both a vaccine scientist and autism parent, he has led national efforts to defend vaccines and serves as an ardent champion of vaccines against a growing national anti-vax threat. Most of us know Dr. Hotez from a wide range of appearances on national media, radio, and in newspaper interviews. Before I turn it over to the panel, I wanna remind the viewers that you can ask questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to a few of those during today's session. Others will be answered during an upcoming session. So now I'm gonna turn this over to President Blanchard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Wolf, really appreciate it. And special welcome to you, Dr. Hotez. I have to tell you that I recognize how busy your schedule is and University of Houston downtown campus community really are pleased to know in that you are able to join us today. So essentially what is uh, going to transpire is the fact that as Dr. As, uh, Ms. Wolf just indicated, we are beginning the process now to repopulate our campus. Uh, obviously, as you know, that uh, as a result of COVID-19, many higher education institutions really had to reduce the size of the population on campus. And while there's a misperception that our campuses have closed, that is not the case. We certainly are active here on campus, but with a minimal amount of individuals uh, who are here. And so by June uh, 1, early June, we are going to begin that process of repopulation. And certainly by the fall semester, um, we will be as uh, fully populated as what we were by fall 2019 or somewhere within that range. So with that, we've noticed that we've got a lot of our campus constituents have raised questions and frankly concerns uh, about how to repopulate effectively. Some of those questions, Dr. Hotez, we've been able to answer. Others, we need experts like you to help us. So we just can't thank you enough uh, for joining us. And uh, I tell you, you've got quite a few fans here at the University of Houston downtown. So let me start with the first question, and this is- well, let, me, let me just say before uh, we begin, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you so much, President Blanchard. It's an honor to, um, to, to be here. I've been in Houston. Our family's been in Houston for about 10 years, and we, we know UH downtown. We've given lectures at UH downtown, and so it's, uh, it's a, just a, a wonderful, inspiring place. And thank you for all your great work, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Fantastic. Well, the first question is one that you probably would suspect that we're going to ask. And, you know, it's, it's good to hear directly from our local experts on where we are today. Essentially, can you give us a sense of current COVID-19 conditions in our city, uh, your view on the future, and what role vaccines will continue to play in the future? Well, I think, you know, as we head into the summer, we're going to be looking much better. I think right now, even though the numbers have come down, we're still at a pretty high level of, of transmission. Um, and, 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 and that's partly because we have a couple of the uh, variants of concern circulating, which are 
more transmissible than anything we've seen before. We have the B117 variant from the United Kingdom, the B1429 variant coming from California. These are more transmissible and possibly uh, greater severity and illness. Uh, so that that's the bad news. The good news is there is another side of the rainbow coming and that as we fully vaccinate the American people, I think we are going to be able to vaccinate our way out of it, but it requires us to double our current numbers. So right now, nationally, about 40% of the U.S. population has gotten a single dose of vaccine, um, about half that, uh, two doses of the vaccine. Um, and so we need to uh, get towards double that amount. And then we're really going to start seeing declines in, in transmission. So it's it's a matter of, of hanging on. So in terms of the practicality of opening up UH downtown or any of the campuses in Houston, or even nationally, I think that's about the timing that by summer, we should be able to do that safely if we get those really high levels of vaccination coverage. The, the, only, the only uncertainty is, is can we do that? Because um, 80% of the US population is a pretty high bar. It means that we need almost all of the adults and most of the adolescents vaccinated across the country. And we are moving at a pretty good clip, um, not doing as well in Texas as we are in some parts of the country. So, for instance, New Hampshire already has a 60 percent of its population with a single dose of vaccine. Now, now, of course, New Hampshire is about the size of us in terms of population of a suburb of Houston. <laughs> but, but but so you get get the idea. But I think it, that shows you what what is possible. I mean, Texas does have its constraints because of its size and geography and large rural population and and high concentration of low-income neighborhoods. These are all challenging places to vaccinate. We also have a pretty aggressive uh, anti-vaccine movement, but, but that is the reality. If we can really ramp up our level of vaccination, I think we're going to be looking really strong. For now, I think while we have the B117 variant here and my colleagues at Houston Methodist, indicate that uh, it is a high percentage of the virus isolates enough where in other places we would start to see an uptick in number of cases, that's still possible. So we are sort of in the middle of our fourth peak right now nationally, and there's a question of whether that fourth peak is going to look like a hill or, or a mountain. So bottom line, good new, we're going to be in a good news uh, situation over by the summer, I predict, uh, but we're going to have the next... Uh, six six to seven weeks are going to be the tough part. Oh, you're muted. I was trying to unmute and it kept telling me I couldn't unmute. So yeah, thank thank you for that for that answer. And you know the reality is what you alluded to the fact that we're making uh, quite a bit of headway with the vaccination of adults. Um, and obviously I'll ask a question about children very shortly, but one of the pieces that we're continuing to hear, especially from our campus community and, and the larger community as well, is that even with the increasing number of adults who are getting vaccinated, there are many questions about how effective and how safe the vaccinations are. Can you speak to this, please? Yeah, certainly the two mRNA vaccines are the from Moderna and, and Pfizer BioNTech. I got the Pfizer BioNTech look tremendous in terms of level of vaccine efficacy around 95% in protecting symptomatic illness. We know now from several studies that it also halts virus transmission, including asymptomatic infection, maybe at a little lower rate around 90%. But you know, these, these, that's about as good as it gets in, in the world of uh, vaccines. So they're very efficacious vaccines. Safety profile looks really good. And now it's been given to tens of millions of Americans without any unexpected uh, safety signal. The J&J &J vaccine has been put on hold. Uh, and that's because it's in rare instances, it seems to be producing a serious illness known as cerebral thrombosis. We've seen this in the J&J &J vaccine. And we've seen it now in the AstraZeneca vaccine. And the common denominator is they're both uh, adenovirus vectored vaccines. So you have the two mRNA, mRNA vaccines, uh, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. That does not seem to be uh, so much of an issue, but it is a rare complication of, the of both of the adenovirus vectored vaccines. And then the question is, 
how are the regulators going to deal with it? Because the AstraZeneca has not applied for emergency use authorization yet in the United States. While we've already started rolling out the J&J vaccine and pick this up, um, the good news is that we've got a very robust safety monitoring mechanism to pick up these things, uh, which in itself is pretty impressive if you think about it, that we could pick up a one in a hundred thousand or one in a million event. Um, but now it's on pause and we should get an answer later this week. I, was, I suspect on how we're going to move forward. And I don't know exactly what's going to happen at that point. It may give us what's called a black box warning from the FDA saying it's a rare side effect. If they just do that generally for the population, I think that's going to throw cold water on enthusiasm for the vaccine. People are not going to want to take it. If they could be a little more surgical in the sense that they can identify a very specific population that's at risk and then back and just put the black box warning on that particular population, leaving all the other groups to move forward. I think that's the best outcome we can hope for, uh, but but we'll see in, in the coming days. Sorry that I'm having challenges unmuting. Um, it's the, li li life in the time of COVID. Right? I know. It takes three tries before I can get it here. So you mentioned side effects, and that is one of the, the big questions, right, is, is why do some people have a reaction to the vaccine, particularly when it seems to be around the second dose, while others may not have any side effects or reactions at all? Is there some rhyme or reason, reason to this? So just to, just to clarify, um, when we talk about side effects, we're not talking about the cerebral thrombosis from the J&J &J vaccine. So let's, let's park that as a separate serious concern. The side effects from the two mRNA vaccines, um, they can be unpleasant, but, but they're not life-threatening. So um, some, what happens is the, these vaccines do activate what's called the innate immune system as, as well as the acquired immune system for stimulating antibodies. And by stimulating the innate immune system, it does trigger uh, a lot of inflammation. So people get a fever, um, you can get shaking chills, you can get headache, you can get uh, body aches, you can get arm soreness. And, and that's true of just about every vaccine. It just seems to do it more consistently with, with the mRNA vaccines. And it's all over the map in terms of how people respond. Some people get it on the first dose, some get it on the second dose, and others get no reaction at all. And and how one predicts is unclear. I think if, if the only prediction, I think, is that if you've had previous infection, um, that's almost like getting the first dose of the vaccine as far as priming the immune system. So when you get your, your actual first dose, then I think you may react more than if you did not have previous COVID infection. Uh, for instance, I got the second dose. I don't think I had COVID before I got the second dose. And uh, about 24 hours afterwards, I had shaking chills for a few hours. And I didn't feel so good and just went to bed and woke up the next morning feeling a bit achy. And by, took some Advil later that morning. And by the afternoon, I was fine. So it was about 12 hours of, of discomfort. So what I recommend is if you, on the day you are getting vaccinated, uh, don't plan an ambitious schedule. Um, you know, don't, don't get vaccinated the day before you're scheduled to take a final exam. Don't, um, don't get vaccinated the day before you're going to do a thesis presentation. Uh, make sure you do it around the time when you're having to do important things in case you do feel crummy. And, and need to just go home and rest. And, uh, and then I think that should work out really well. So one of our students raised the question about the existing condition. So uh, the, the student asked, if I have asthma, is there a better vaccine for me? Are there some people with underlying conditions that should just avoid receiving the vaccine altogether? The answer is pretty much no. I mean, anybody should be eligible for getting vaccinated. The one exception, um, the two exceptions people make, first of all, for the 
for the uh, Johnson and Johnson vaccine. We'll see what kind of black box warning comes along. There may be a specific population. The FDA recommends that you don't that you don't get vaccinated. But for the mRNA vaccines, pretty much uh, most most individuals should be able to get it if you have a known severe allergic reaction to something called PEG, polyethylene glycol. It is one of the components of the of the vaccine. PEG is a food additive. It most people with PEG allergies don't know they have PEG allergy, so that's why we weigh heavy weight for thirty minutes after you get vaccinated to make certain you're not having a serious reaction. The rate of anaphylaxis, which is severe allergic reaction, from the two mRNA vaccines is between two and eleven per million. Um, which is a little bit higher than the one to two per million for the flu vaccine, for the HPV vaccine, for cervical cancer and other cancers, but it's still a very rare event. So um, definitely move forward. There are, um, uh, if you have, if you have a severe uh, underlying condition uh, related to cancer or blood disorder, um, chances are you're in the care of a specialist and you probably want to have that discussion with your physician before you move forward. But the vast majority of people should be able to take um, a COVID-19 vaccine and, and including somebody with asthma. One of our parents is asking, going back to the, uh, the availability of vaccines, when do you believe that we'll start seeing vaccine availability? Well, I think we're already start, we'll probably have the green light to start vaccinating adolescents pretty soon, maybe by the summer. So Pfizer will apply for emergency use, uh, will extend the emergency use authorization for the adolescents, 12 to 15 year olds. It's already been approved for emergency use in 16 and older. So I would think that's probably going to happen, um, the, the 12 to 15 year olds. And uh, and probably for the Moderna vaccine as well, and that's really good news because it means that by the fall semester, we should have the junior high schools, middle schools, high schools, all set to go and 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 ready to go, um, so that the students will be vaccinated, the teachers, the staff. For the little kids, I think it's going to take longer um, because. We're usually a little slower on the safety studies. We give it more time, in part because in, in, in the case of the little kids, the peak incidence of the severe inflammatory syndrome in kids from the virus from COVID-19 called MISC, um, stands for, I don't know who comes up with these acronyms, stands for multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children. That occurs about one to two thousand from the kids from the virus. It's a it's a it's a late stage complication of COVID nineteen mm -hmm. in kids. It peaks around the five to nine age group. So I think what you'll see is if we start doing clinical trials on young kids, probably they'll want to follow that closely to make certain that for whatever reason that the vaccine doesn't worsen MISC. I don't think it will, but that'll take time to sort out. So I don't think the little kids will start vaccinating until next year. But it doesn't mean we can't open elementary schools because um, as 80% of the US population gets vaccinated, transmission is gonna go way, way down. So that that's really good news. So I think quality of life is gonna be incredibly good uh, uh, by the summer. It's very encouraging. So one of our uh, campus constituents is looking at the pandemic through the global lens and asking the question, can the spread of the virus be reduced if the United States largely gets vaccinated, but developing countries still lack access? Yeah, no, it's an important question. And unfortunately, you know, we did not do a good job looking after the world's low and middle income countries so that by the summer, fall, you know, well, the countries that can operate freely and are fully vaccinated are just going to be a handful. It's going to be the U.S., maybe Canada, U.K., maybe some Western European countries, Israel, maybe two or three others, and that's it. So, you know, and so that means we'll be able to fly domestically. But in terms of international travel, most of the world may still be sort of off limits because of all of the high transmission 
And, you know, one of the hopes was that the J&J vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine were going to be the workhorse ones because you can keep them at refrigerator temperature. It's, they're not that difficult to scale up. But I worry now with the incidence of, um, uh, even though it's a rare complication of, uh, of the cerebral thrombotic events and other thromboembolic events, from these vaccines, what that's going to do to public perception. So with vaccines, public perception counts for a lot. And as, or the way I like to say, it doesn't take much for a vaccine, even a good vaccine to be voted off the island. So you're starting to see now uh, in Africa that uh, boxes of the AstraZeneca vaccine are going unused and allowed to spoil um, because of those concerns. And part of that is because of the anti-vaccine disinformation campaign, the Putin government, and this has been reported by U.S. and British intelligence, by a, a monitoring uh, service that the Putin government has been actively discrediting the AstraZeneca vaccine um, and the J&J &J vaccine so it could prop up its own Sputnik V vaccine or Sputnik V vaccine. The irony is it's the same type, and so it's likely the same thing is happening to the Sputnik V vaccine. It's just that what the Russians are doing is they're peddling it heavily in a lot of low- and middle-income countries that do not have adequate pharmacovigilance mechanisms in place like we do in the U.S. and U.K. So it could very well be happening with that vaccine, too. We just wouldn't know about it. So this has caused a lot of disruption, and a lot of us are worried about it. One of the things that we're doing is we're accelerating a low-cost recombinant protein COVID vaccine that was that we developed in our labs at Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine. And now that's being scaled uh, for a billion doses uh, with, a, with a major vaccine producer in India known as Biological E. That's why I kind of came out at the last minute because I was on a Zoom call with Biological E in India, as we are all the time. And um, it's looking really good in clinical trials. And it uses the same technology as the hepatitis B vaccine that's been used for decades. It's, it's a recombinant protein uh, genetically engineered in yeast. It's looking really strong and there's no upper bound to the amount you could produce. So biological in the E in India is producing uh, 1.2 billion doses. If the US government wanted to support low and middle income countries, they could make the other four or five billion needed to vaccinate the world. And so those discussions are also beginning as well. So it's really great to be able to make that kind of contribution. So going back to the, the efficacy of the, the vaccination, uh, one of the looming questions for many people is once vaccinated, what is the estimate, if known, of how long the vaccine will be effective? Yeah, this is one of the problems with using all new technology vaccines. We have no roadmap to go on. We haven't seen this before. So the good news is it's looking as though it's still protective in it's still protecting the human volunteers that were first immunized last year. So that's really good news. Um, and then um, the but the likelihood is we'll all get boosters at some point. And so that if you got the two dose, mRNA vaccine, you should anticipate being asked to get a third dose. And what that third dose is going to do is it's going to boost your existing levels of antibody. It's going to uh, make your level of protection more durable. And that boost will be a little different from the vaccines you got before because it'll be tailored for the variants, some of the variants of concern that are coming out of South Africa and Brazil. So let's take a step back. It looks as though the, that, the vaccines that we are using currently um, not only work against the or, original lineage, they also work really well against the B117 variant from the United Kingdom and the B1429 from, from California, which is circulating now. So that's great news. And I think those are going to be the dominant variant for the foreseeable future. So that's great news. The not so good news is there are other variants of concerns coming from South Africa and Brazil for which the level of protection does seem to decline. It still partially protects, but not as well as you'd like. And that would be the, another reason for getting the boost um, either later this year or next year. And then the question on what that always follows is, okay, does Dr. Hotez, does that mean we're going to now need to give a booster every year? Is it going to be like influenza? And there's 
no consent. There's, there's not a consensus opinion. I'm of the opinion that all of the variants are converging to a couple that are already going to be in that booster. So we may not need any more vaccinations after that. Others feel that we will need annual boosts. In fact, I think I saw an interview with the Pfizer by Pfizer CEO saying they might even co-formulate mRNA vaccine with flu in order to make that annual vaccination possible. But uh, I don't necessarily think that's the case. So, so the, the key is not to get overwhelmed. You know, when you hear about all the variants and the boosts, you go, oh my God, am I going to just be like a pincushion getting vaccinated all the time? The answer is no, I think. I think it's the vaccines work really well against the, all of the major variants that are here in the United States, the, the dominant ones, the B117 variant, the California variant. You're going to be good at least for the rest of the year. Later on this year, next year, you may be asked to get a single boost, and then you may be done. Um, I, no guarantees, but I think that's how it's looking. And, and that's true of masks as well. I think it's going to be likelihood, likely that masks can start to come off in the summer. I think quality, I think life will look almost like normal starting by the summer. The only thing I would be mindful of, even if you're vaccinated, is there still may be a blip or a peak again of the virus starting next January. And that's based on some meth, um, epidemiologic modeling coming out of Mark Lipsitch's group at Harvard. So there may be a period of a few weeks where we may ask you to don masks again for that few week period during when things start to accelerate up again in January, but that would be it. Then it would come off again. So, you know, the, the point is the roadmap to me looks pretty good. There are going to be some bumps in terms of needing a booster, maybe putting masks on in January, but compared to what we've been through this, it's, small potatoes, as we say, it's, we, we can, we can do this. Okay. You've addressed a lot of the questions that uh, came from our campus constituents around the variants. Um, and not only in terms of will the current vaccination regimen uh, have an impact on the variants, uh, but also can we uh, expect to see, continue to see new variants arrive? I think that based on the responses you've given that you've answered all of those questions, but yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that people worry about, and they say, oh, my God, well, we're always going to be chasing our tail because all these variants are always arising. The truth is, right. when you actually look at the actual variants, they all go by sort of a recurring theme. They all seem to have some combination of, a, of like four or five different amino acid substitutions in the spike protein, uh, the part that binds to the receptor. And so by making one var one booster that that covers those four or five, that may be it. I, you know, I don't think you're going to just start seeing random mutations all over the place. Now, having said that, I could be wrong because it's a new virus pathogen. Also, keep in mind that even though we are going to vaccinate our way out of this pandemic, um, at least in the U.S., there are other coronaviruses out there. And so keep in mind, we've seen SARS in 2003, we saw MERS in 2012, now we've seen COVID-19. So who knows, we could see COVID-26 or COVID-32. And for that, we're also exploring developing a universal coronavirus vaccine. You mentioned SARS and have SARS viruses always been this deadly or is it, or is this like a recent development? I think the first deadly SARS was the one in 2003, and that's what really shocked the, the public health and medical community because before then, all we knew about coronaviruses were they were a cause of an upper respiratory infection that caused a cold. Um, so that was the, or rarely more severe illness, but, and you know, when, when I was getting trained in infectious diseases, I'd heard about coronaviruses. You know, I may have had one lecture on it or, it was something that you studied for a board exam, but it was never something that you gave a lot of thought to. That all changed starting in 2002, 2003, when we had our first big coronavirus epidemic. One of our um, staff members says, I am vaccinated and I have two or more morbidity factors. Is it safe for me to be in public? 
Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think so. Well, let me take a step back. Right now, well, first of all, the vaccines are not 100%. Um, in fact, the CDC reported last week that there's been about 5,800 breakthrough infections with people who are vaccinated. Now that's out of 77 million. And maybe the number of breakthrough infections even underestimated, but it's still, you know, really high, you know, well over 90, 95% uh, protective, but it's not 100%. So the, the risk though, in terms of being vaccinated going out in public goes way down when we slow virus transmission. So that's why it's so important for every to be, everyone to get vaccinated. So if you have a lot of underlying risk factors, you might be someone who, while we're still in this phase before we fully vaccinate the American people, might not want to go to restaurants and do all the normal stuff. And and But that's going to improve because as the level of transmission goes down, then it becomes safe. I think, and that's, so that's great news. I think... The other thing to keep in mind, though, is risk is never going to go to zero, right? Or unlikely to go to zero. It's so, but 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 I think quality of life can definitely improve, and you can have some comfort level um, as transmission really starts to slow. I know that we have a number of individuals listening in today, and that begs on the questions that I've raised thus far in your responses. That there are other questions, but I want to raise one more with you. And then I'll turn it back over to Ms. Wolf, who can address some of the questions that she's getting directly from audience members right now. Um, and this one is, does the vaccine affect fertility or pregnancy? Uh, not, as, not as far as we know. There's no evidence for that. But keep in mind where that misinformation is coming from. What the anti-vaccine lobby did was they made that same assertion for the HPV vaccine for cervical cancer and other cancers. And, and that, that worked for them in, in a pyrrhic way, right? People stopped vaccinating against cervical cancer, even though there was no truth to it. They said, hmm, that works. So let's copy paste it and stick it onto COVID-19 vaccine. So that's what you're dealing with. So there's no evidence that the, the mRNA vaccines affect fertility, um, nor do they cause spontaneous abortions, nor do they cause autoimmunity. So it's just part of the disinformation empire that's out there. Thank you, Dr. Hotez. Let me swing it back now to Ms. Wolf, who I'm sure has some questions that have been raised by our audience members. Ms. Wolf? Yes, thank you. Let me ask a couple of questions that have come in. One is um, whether or not it's true that vaccines could offer symptom relief to COVID-19 long haulers. Is there any evidence of that? Not from clinical studies. Um, it's anecdotally, it's been reported. And um, a number of people have said they who've had long haul COVID symptoms that they get vaccinated and they seem to go away. Um, why that would be is a little unclear because there's no evidence that long haul COVID is due to active virus infection. It's due to an inflammatory response, immune response to the virus that you had. So why the vaccine would make it go away, it may be the case, but there's no obvious mechanism that we have yet. Um, possibly it's a placebo effect, uh, which, and it's not to minimize, but placebo effects can be quite powerful. Um, so right now it's a bit of a medical mystery um, I don't think anybody expected that, but you know, if it really is the case, we'll take it, right? So we'll see That's how right. we'll we'll see if we can really document it, and um, or whether it just turns out to be a, a few uh, anecdotes among individuals. Okay, so uh, someone has asked on the chat if they've received the J and J vaccine, at what what's the time frame for any reactions? I mean, how long should they? Uh, how long should they be concerned or sort of be on the lookout for any reactions? Well, we'll see what the um, FDA document says if it comes out this week. But what we've heard so far is between six and 13 days afterwards. So between one and two weeks is the worrisome period. But and then after that, it, it goes way down. So that would be the, the time um, if it were going to happen, most likely. That's what we've seen so far, a week to two weeks after 
week to two weeks out after the immunization. Okay. Um, and another person has asked if they are going to an event where it's indoor, outdoor, and everybody there says they've been vaccinated, do, do, do we need to wear masks? Can we put them away, slip them in our back pocket? Yeah, and the answer is I, I think if everybody is vaccinated, you should be okay not wearing masks. Um, and um, and that's the why we're getting vaccinated, right? To get back to, right. well, one, you want to get a, stay out of the hospital in the ICU, but the other is to get back to a normal quality of life. And and you'll see more and more of that. The Centers for Disease Controls have been a bit a bit been a bit cautious and lifting. Uh, and, and their recommendations in terms of lifting restrictions, I think it's because they want to see transmission go down because the, va the vaccines are not 100% efficacious. But I think you'll start to see that as transmission really starts to go down uh, to a really low level, then, then things will open up in a way that we haven't seen in a long time. Um, this question is, how long do the COVID antibodies stay in effect? This person says they had a mild case late 2020, and uh, when they gave blood early this year, the blood center reported that they still had the COVID antibodies. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, at around two year, for two years, if it's like the first SARS, it may depend on your severity of illness. Um, so those who are really sick may have longer lasting antibodies than those who had asymptomatic uh, illness. Um, but the point is, if you've been infected and recovered, you still want to get vaccinated, so you still get more durable, um, protective uh, Im immunity. But the Sorry about that. I have my own technical problem, um, but I, but I think um, um, the 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 level of protective efficacy varies from person to person, and that's why you want to get vaccinated still. Okay. Are there any groups that have been excluded from taking the vaccine? Any um, anybody who they say you know for whatever reason this group of people should not take it? So far, just the ones with known PEG polyethylene glycol allergy, which is extremely rare for the for the mRNA vaccines. For the J&J &J vaccine, I'm expecting a black box warning, uh, and we'll see if that includes certain groups that shouldn't get it. What we've heard is that it's mostly premenopausal women who have had the problem with the J&J &J vaccine. Mm -hmm. now, whether, now, the hope would be if that we can fine tune it a bit more, that it's... Um, uh, premenopausal women who've just given birth to to a newborn, or because we know they're at higher risk of thromboembolic events, or women who are smokers, or women on birth control. But we'll see what what comes out of all of this, and that's why they need that extra time to do the analysis. Okay. Uh, and I think this may be one of the last questions we have here. With COVID still raging in Brazil and India and some other countries where they're behind in getting people vaccinated, should we be concerned about new variants showing up in the coming months that well, are resistant? We are, well, that, we, that already, are, we already have the P1 variant from Brazil that concerns us, and it's already here in Houston, although it's still a minor variant. And the answer is yes, that's why we're going to get the boost. Um, and unfortunately, unless um, we fix this problem of vaccine equity, um, a lot of people in Latin America and Africa are still not going to be vaccinated. And that's going to limit our potential to do business with these countries. And it's going to and it's it's going to slow our economic recovery. So I think what we're going to see is we will see a pickup in our economy after um, everyone is vaccinated in the U.S. and the oil and gas industry will start doing better. And I know that's important here. My youngest son is in the oil and gas industry. And, um, and what we'll see is it'll start to pick up as people are driving again, flying domestically. But then it's going to then it's going to halt. It's going to stop at a plateau because Africa and Latin America and the Middle East are not fully open yet. So that's the other reason to get that vaccine out there is to really get back to full normality. Great. Well, I want to thank um, both of you for today and give you a few minutes to make some final comments. Dr. Hotez? 
Yeah, I'll just say, you know, I keep on trying to sound this upbeat note, and that's genuine. I think we're going to be doing extremely well uh, as a country by the summer. It's just a matter of hanging on now the next six, seven weeks or so, not doing reckless things and keeping mind, be mindful of the fact that there's still a lot of virus transmission going on. And it's from variants like the UK and California variant that make people sicker than we've seen before. And it's more transmissible and even young people are getting sick. But after that, um, as we fully vaccinate, um, uh, the American people and get colleges fully vaccinated, you're going to see uh, a, a real game changer. So as I say, it's just a matter of getting everyone to the other side of the rainbow. Dr. Blanchard. So Dr. Hotez, I know that uh, we have ended our questions, but, but, but I have two others. One is just a restatement of where you think um, in terms of what the science is showing us, where will we be this summer and where will we be this fall, uh, particularly as it relates to the fact that, as you well know, many of us are working to ramp up for summer school and obviously ramping up even further for the fall. Just a restatement of, of where we, you think that we will be and what all the science is uh, suggesting at this point um, for the repopulation of our campuses. Well, right now, 40% of the U.S. population has gotten a single dose of vaccine. By the summer, the hope is that we'll be closer to 80% of the population that's received two doses of the vaccine. So as we get out to the middle of June, July, I think you're going to see a dramatic decline in, in virus transmission. And then at that point, I would feel comfortable recommending back to in-person classes, um, uh, assuming everybody's the students and the teachers are, are fully vaccinated, transmission will be way down. A lot of it in, uh, depends in part on the on vaccine hesitancy and resistance. You know, we've got a segment of the U.S. population that's defiant of masks, and that may uh, allow transmission to continue. And unfortunately, it's coming out of conservative groups, and and it's being played out on Fox News, and you've got. You know, the late, the late, the nighttime Fox News anchors have been going on these anti-vaccine rants and going after me and other scientists, and that's got to stop because we need the U.S. population fully vaccinated. And if that happens, then the it, the, the the summer of the summer of twenty twenty one should look like the summer of twenty nineteen. With, with the one exception that we're not going to be traveling all over the world. We may be traveling domestically. Um, but And so that is one. And then the economy will be better, but not fully back to normal. And my last question is, is there anything that we should have asked uh, that is certainly uh, top of mind for you right now that, that you'd like to answer? Well, I think, you know, you know, UHD, like a lot of colleges, takes a lot of international students. And, yes. and, and, you know, we've got, you know, large, you know, Houston's one of the big gateway cities. You, you know, you know, nobody's actually from Houston, right? I mean, everyone's from all over the world. And, and, um, and that's, that's one of our strengths is our diversity. But the part of the, the issue I think is going to be there is a lot of students that you want to take internationally may come onto campus unvaccinated because they don't have access to the vaccine. For instance, you know, we have a massive Nigerian expat community here in Houston. I think it's the second largest, or I think it's the largest in the world outside of Nigeria. They don't have vaccine in Nigeria. So how do you manage that? Should we ask those, should you be asking those students to come to campus a month earlier to get them fully vaccinated and and what are the logistics around that? I think those kinds of things are gonna be important also. Very timely. And even the flip side of it in terms of our students uh, who have had the great benefit of engaging in study abroad and they wanna travel internationally as right. well as our faculty members who are engaged in- Right, right. Unless, unless they're going to the UK or France or, or Israel, or some maybe some countries in the Middle East, they're going to be going to places where there's a lot of COVID transmission. And then 
the university has will have to set some policy around that regarding student safety and 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 all those sorts of things. And and the goalposts will keep moving because as we go further and further out, more and more countries will have access to vaccine vaccines, hopefully, and we'll have to be mindful of that as well. And and the other thing that I would you know what I've seen works well is uh, that the universities do this together, especially in Houston. Because if University of St. Thomas is not doing it, but you are, you know, students will start to cherry pick, you know, I, I'm going to go over to that university as well. And, and that and that doesn't work. So it, I think it I think it works better if not only the UH system decides as a whole what they're going to do for policy, but also the other universities in Houston, you know, meet on, a, as I'm sure you're doing, meet on a regular basis and try to be on the same page in terms of consistency so as to avoid confusion. On that note, I can't thank you enough, Dr. Hotez. This has been exceptionally helpful, uh, not only in terms of making sure that we have the accurate information, but also being able to use that information for our planning purposes. Uh, and that everything that you've said today, as well as uh, the benefit that we've had from Dr. Purse, and we'll also have the benefit uh, of Dr. Spann as well that's coming up. Uh, I can't tell you the great value that it brings to us and can't thank you enough for all the work that you're doing that's benefiting not just us here at UHD, but certainly the city of Houston and the state of Texas as well. So thank you very much. Well, th thank you. And, you know, I can't imagine anything more difficult than being a university president these this last year and a half. And thanks for hanging in there. And, uh, and uh, all I can say is, the, I, I think the worst is over, and and we've we've got a very bright future for all of the universities and colleges in our city. That's the best news ever. Let me just uh, put in a, a quick advertisement for the fact that this Thursday, April twenty second, uh, we will have UHD COVID Vaccination Day right here on campus, uh, and it's open to all faculty, staff, and students. Uh, and any family members of age 16 years or older of, fam of uh, faculty, staff, or students that are interested as well and have not yet been vaccinated can come right here to UHD uh, and get your vaccination. There is a registration process that's on our website. We ask you to go and visit um, and get that registration done. Uh, we look forward to seeing you here on Thursday. Uh, one final note is just a special thank you as well. Uh, to Ms. Wolf, as well as to Dr. Eliza Lanza has been really helpful in pulling all of this together. Uh, we also have, i to find the names of the two staff people as well. Oh, here we go. Mr. Sam Bible, Mr. Richard Vera, uh, all have been exceptionally helpful in ensuring that we have benefited from these forum sessions. And on that note, I'll give you 12 minutes of your time back uh, for this uh, soon to be noon hour. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you for the third and final forum that's upcoming. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.